many honors and uh, distinctions that have been bestowed upon him, uh, among which is that he is able to grace us with his presence here despite the many storms that have thrown kings in his travel plan throughout the week because of the trustee meetings here. And uh, the reason we're most excited to talk to him today is that uh, one of these distinctions is as IFLA Honorary Fellow. And so we will be hearing from him about that. And do you need any text set up at all? We weren't sure, but I had a feeling that you didn't from the time you No. Okay, I wish, if I had a little more Should time, I, I might have. Yes. Uh, no, I think I'm fine. No, 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 I'm, I'm Although if we could um, put the cups oh, yeah. down yeah. just because I can't. Well, that's probably a good idea. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I don't understand. Can everyone see this? Yeah, no, the cups are down. We're all fine, I think. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be able to have a chance to chat a little bit today about this. Um, as she indicated, I have had quite a time. I was in ALA in Chicago and could not get back to Baltimore. Oh, yes. I was straight to New York for a donor event and then I'm here, so I didn't have all the things together that I had initial plans to, to bring, but maybe that's just as well. So I thought I've been involved in IFLA for so long now, I could easily talk about this kind of off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would talk a little bit about what IFLA is, how it works, what it does, and then how it, you might be able to become involved or not. So, uh, IFLA started uh, about 80 years or so ago. I went to my first IFLA meeting in 1989 uh, in Paris for the first uh, annual conference and have been to every one since then, so I haven't been doing this for a long time. Uh, and it's changed, though, dramatically and all for the better, I think, as an organization. So I'll just tell you my little anecdote. I was at the Library of Congress. I went to my first meeting in 1989. Um, IFLA was organized around various standing committees. So I happened at the time to be the uh, chief of the loan division at the Library of Congress, so I went to the interlending, uh, and there were 10, 12 white men there. I was one of the youngest by far of all the group, and at the time, they would begin every other year with the elections of offices. So I sat down, never having met a single one of these people, having no idea what would happen or how things actually worked. The first agenda item was the election of the chair. And they said, uh, for chair, we shall elect Dr. Niedemann from Germany. Everyone applied. <laughs> they said, for secretary, we shall elect Mr. Tab of the Library of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and I suddenly realized, I think I just got elected. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of the beginning. <laughs> and I've been involved in one way or the other ever since then. So it really was a very strange experience. The most wonderful thing I think that's happened though, and I'd like to think I had quite a lot to do with this, is really to change the governance in a very dramatic way. So this is no longer an old white men's organization. It really is much, much more engaging than it ever was before. For many, many years, including up until about 1996, seven, something like that, uh, the elections for the officers, for example, of IFL, the president of IFLA, would happen at the annual meeting, and you had to be physically present to come. But what does this tell you? That every August you have to go to a different foreign country. Who gets to go there? The directors of library, <laughs> all the white men. So it was um, really quite improper, I think, from the point of view of democratic governance and the way that you want to feel that you are in the, in the library profession. And so I was really happy to be able to actually chair a committee that led to the revamping of the governance now. So the, all of the elections are done by ballot, and it can be by mail ballot or by electronic, but everyone who is a member of IFLA may vote. And that is the reason why I think in the last few years as we've changed the way in which things work, we have had uh, quite a variety of people, two women from Africa, for example, two from Europe, one from Canada, and now I'm really, really happy to see that the next election, uh, which has not been formally announced yet, will have two candidates for the president of IFLA. Uh, a Hispanic woman, which who would be the first uh, Spanish-speaking person to be elected to president of IFLA, and I'm very hopeful she's going to win, uh, and uh, a man from Egypt as well, so he would be the first Arabic-speaking person too. So very interesting to see how things have changed over time. I mention this because it's important to know that IFLA is an organization, as the name might imply, the International Federation of Library Associations. Technically, it's also an institution, but the acronym has never changed. So from the very beginning, and until fairly recently, really, a part of this change at the very uh, the 
It was 1997, I believe. Only library associations were permitted to be members, so if there was an acronym. And not only that, but the numbers of votes that were given uh, depended upon the number of members of the association. So by far, the largest number of votes was for the American Library Association, because it had 60,000 members, even though it was only one association. So one of the changes that uh, I brought about was to include institutions also, so at least libraries may be members. Mm -hmm. And this happened when I was trying to nominate someone uh, when I was at the Library of Congress, and I was not able, even as a li deputy librarian of Congress, to nominate someone because I had to go ask other people to nominate because we were only a library. So now it's International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. The institutions are all libraries. There are no individual members of IFLA except for the honorary fellows, which is what I said. <laughs> so there are only, I think, five or six of us living now. So basically, so that's one of the questions I often ask and wanted to be sure you understood. This is not the kind of thing where, like ALA, you can decide, oh, I want to join IFLA and just send a check and suddenly you're a member. So IFLA is much more like, say, the Association of Research Libraries in the United States where the library is the member and the director of the library represents, but it's not an individual. That does not mean, however, that there are not many ways in which individuals may be involved. So anyone in the world who chooses to go and spend the money may go to the annual meeting. The annual conference is held almost always the third week of August in some country that you may not want to be in in August. <laughs> so one of the things that also has changed over the years is to have a much more um, predictable and kind of rigorous pattern of movement around the world. So uh, in the time when I was the chair of the professional committee and on the governing board, we were still at the point where any country that wanted to petition to be the host could do that. And quite often we would have the choice of three places in Europe, and which was fine if we wanted to go to Europe, but this was always a problem, say, for the people in Australia, always mm -hmm. going somewhere else. So um, one of the things that we had suggested for kind of revamping of this, if we're truly an international organization, there should be some more orderly way in which to go to all parts of the world. So now the world has been divided into, I think, uh, five different regions, and uh, there's a seven-year cycle so that we can predict on a fairly regular basis what part of the world we'll be going to. Uh, so last year we were in France, and next year we're going to Cape Town to South Africa in August. And then the next year we're coming to the United States. So that's really important. <laughs> One of the things I want to get to right away because I really hope that all of you who are interested would take advantage of the opportunity to go to Columbus, Ohio. You can imagine people were shocked to think, where is this Columbus, Ohio? Where is this Columbus, Ohio? <laughs> 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 you're talking Ohio about the <laughs> <laughs> people from, even from Europe would have yeah, you know, yeah. no idea what <laughs> It's going to be a wonderful conference, I think, and I say everyone is, is eligible to come to register and to come and participate, so please be thinking about the little week. It's the third week of August, I believe, in Columbus, and would not possibly be back in the United States again for another seven years, based upon the way the rotation goes. And in fact, who knows when it will actually be back in the U.S., because it's really North America is the category for every seventh year. So our last time in North America was in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. So not everyone thought that that would be necessarily the US, but of course it is, and before that in Canada. So it's a great opportunity to kind of go. I would be surprised if the um, US organizers were not beginning at some point, maybe not until the summer, to start asking for volunteers. Because quite often that's what we do. They have a lot of people to help the foreign guests uh, be able to get around. So for those of you who might be interested in IFLA and having a first-hand experience, this is at least an opportunity perhaps to do that in a way that would not be so time-consuming or so expensive as it might be to some of the other venues. <coughs> IFLA has a lot of um, opportunities for involvement, which is also not about going to meetings or participating in the governance by individuals, but taking advantage of the resources that exist online. And so I would just suggest that's a good place to go and to explore and see what some of those resources are. One of the things that we've been very good about, I think, at IFLA is being, again, in the last 10, 15 years, much more open 
to letting people who have these kind of communities of interest create new interest groups and new discussion groups. So they come and they go, and I think it's now on a three or four year cycle. So if we had, say, the knowledge management discussion group at the time, people hardly knew what knowledge management was, then it kind of gently evolved as more of a discipline, was able to become an actual standing committee and become a much more formal organization. Sometimes things just go away because there's no longer interest, but I think that's the way it ought to be much more in our world, uh, given how quickly we're changing what we do and how our profession is changing. But there are a lot of opportunity for this kind of birds of a feather type of aggregation um, for anyone who happens to be at the meeting to come and participate fully. People are very, very open to, and particularly to young people and people who are new to the profession, uh, to come and be part of whether it's cataloging or preservation or whatever it may be. Um, I was very active, as I said, at the um, interlibrary lending for a while in, in the National Libraries when I was at Library of Congress, and I have been on preservation. But now I decide to give myself a treat because I'm always doing things that I have to do, and so I nominated myself to be on the Rare Book Committee just because I'm really interested. In <laughs> to me, it's so much fun to go and do something which is just personally, professionally satisfying. One of the most important things, though, that Ripple is able to do uh, is to represent librarians internationally in venues that are extremely important. And so, um, again, I have to speak as a personal experience, but one of the things that we have been doing since 2003, uh, when I went for the first time representing uh, Ripple to the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, which is the United Nations organization, uh, that is responsible for international copyright. Um, I ran for president of IFLA in 2003, and the ballots came out two weeks after Bush invaded Iraq. And that was not a very propitious time. <laughs> uh, so I was not elected president, but I was given this kind of consolation prize as chairing uh, the Copyright Committee of IFLA, which was and remains one of the only two committees that are for the whole of the association as opposed to the small entity in the world classification. Uh, and it was in that role that I first went to the World Intellectual Property Organization where no librarians had ever been before. <laughs> and it was a perfect time because it was right when a lot of the countries, particularly from Latin America, even northern from Africa, but particularly Latin America, realized that they needed international assistance in order to get better provisions for their libraries in the intellectual property arena. And so uh, two of the countries there, Chile and Brazil, had recommended in this venue that there be consideration about a treaty. There would be an international treaty that would uh, give certain provisions for libraries all around the world. We're still working on this now, so here we are 12 years later, uh, and I've been going a couple of times a year. We now have very, very strong support from all the countries of Africa and we have extremely strong opposition from the European Union and the United States, but I believe that we're making some progress gradually, particularly in the European uh, Union to be able to get the librarians there to be able to be able to get themselves organized. But I mention this mainly because it's an example of the kind of thing that only people can do. And when you see, particularly, the privileges that we have as librarians in the United States, including with our copyright law, which is by far the best in the world for libraries, the kind of exceptions we have, not perfect and things could be better, but there's nowhere else in the world that anything like what we have. And then you meet with people from Africa where there are no provisions at all for any libraries in their copyright law, where often the government itself charges the libraries and behaves in a way that we, we can hardly find national it's really uh, just this great honor to be able to work in this kind of arena and see that we're making progress, but to be able to have an organization like Ripple that has this international standing in order to do these kinds of things. That's the area where I happen to have been the most active, but there's also a lot of work that's been going on in the area of preservation of cultural heritage. So a lot of work between Ripple uh, and UNESCO, more in this case the United Nations Agency in Paris that functions 
and something called the Blue Shield, where we work together with a lot of other archives and museums uh, to not only to do kind of training, but sometimes actually interventions with almost literally parachuting people into countries where there may be, um, like in Timbuktu, areas where collections may be on the verge of being kind of destroyed, and to try to work together with these other cultural and heritage agencies to do things Neither, no one group could do alone, but particularly the people in the country could not do. So I think providing some visibility is really important because often librarians are, we do ourselves a disservice, I think, by being much too reticent about what we do. But one of the things that I got very proud of, and I think all of us should be, is when I see what happens with the American Library Association and the strong advocacy that we have having a Washington office and people there who go to Congress and who are welcomed by the members of Congress expected to come and to testify. There's really no other country that has anything quite like that. And so there's a direct relationship between the fact that we as librarians in the United States have been willing to pay money to ALA that helps do that advocacy. We have a result where the people who have not done anything like that don't even know really where to begin. So I just, so much of what I have found wonderful and National Librarianship is not only to meet a lot of friends and to do things, but actually to come to appreciate more than I ever could have. Otherwise, how lucky we truly are to be librarians in this country. So I think, let me, maybe I just stop there and see what the <laughs> questions that you may have. I could go on and on about this, but I want to share what all the people think you might be curious about. So let me just open it up. Um, yeah, I wrote down um, kind of two questions-ish. Um, when you were talking about Latin America, I studied uh, social movements in Latin America uh -huh, yeah. and uh, international education spending. Um, I did a, a couple quantitative models for my undergrad. Uh -huh. um, but who, who's supplying like the funding and interest for the Latin American project? Um, and where does the opposition come from on the European US policy side? All right, so uh, actually IFLA has been supplying some substantial part of the funding for the Latin American countries, but what we've been able to do much more than anything is to work very closely with the people in the government. So I have a call with people in the Brazilian Copyright Office about every other month, and so that's not really a question so much of fiscal resources because their government representatives come into the meetings as you need it. What they need to know is what we want and how to describe that and how to give them background information such as data that will help them make the case that they want to be able to make. And one of the really wonderful things has been, again, I focus particularly on Brazil, is that the last two meetings of this uh, Standing Committee on Copyright in Geneva, there have been Brazilian librarians who came for the first time, paid for it by the Brazilian Library Association. So one of the things that's a little bit frustrating uh, to be in these kinds of environments is that um, the, the member states, the people who come from governments, are able to speak at any point when they raise their hand. Those of us who represent the non-governmental organizations aren't always permitted to speak at all. Or if we are, it's always at the end. And sometimes it's like at 6 o'clock at night, theoretically the last hour when everyone else goes off to have a drink or whatever. We're permitted to make our statements for the record. So being able to have these connections with the member state people who get the microphone uh, and have authority in that sense is really important. So what happened with the EU is really very exciting because the last election that occurred there had some really major changes. The EU has been so annoying. I mean, it's really hard to be in the same room with these people. <laughs> over the last couple of years, we'll just say the same thing over and over. There is no international problem. There's no international problem. Whereas we have so many examples of things like interlight rate loan that is an international problem and the movement of data and other kinds of things. But they just say it because that's what they want to say. And part of the reason that they've had that approach has been just the way in which the EU was organized. So they put all of copyright in the area of the EU called the digital market. So they were only thinking about copyright as the economic benefit and something for creators. 
Whereas, of course, we think of it in the U.S. <laughs> as being both. It's really about the public good as well as about the owners. And so we've been always trying to take the high road that we're not opposed to publishers. We talk a lot about how much we spend and that we're not even trying to reduce our costs. What we're trying to do is to be able to do more with the things we're already spending billions of dollars on. So we really have always had the high road. And so, but it was really very exciting to me when this last EU election occurred, they reorganized themselves. And we have now even the commissioner from Germany who's responsible for the digital economy, talking about it both as digital society and digital economy, which in our way talks about public good and the rights holders. I'm feeling a little bit more optimistic now that that may enable us to make some inroads there that we didn't have before. And we've also been working really, really hard to get our European colleagues to step forward. So at the last meeting, we had people from seven different Europeans, seven librarians from different countries who could talk about their own experience on the ground, say, in Germany or in Poland. And of course, if I speak, no one from France cares what I say. They care what our French librarians say. It's the same way the Americans don't really care what our German librarians say. So having these different voices there, different accents. We've been trying always to bring people from Africa also, who are the uh, electronic information for libraries group, is beginning to have people kind of understand that there are problems that they can be solved and they aren't really at the expense of the owner. Or to the degree they are, it's appropriate because it's kind of that general public good. So that's part of my answer. One thing I didn't say too, though, again, that we're very, very lucky in the United States I think all of you have heard of the Institute of Museum and Library Services, mm -hmm. IMLS. We are the only country, as far as I can tell, that actually has a government agency who has some responsibility for libraries, like IMLS. <coughs> and so the general counsel of the IMLS is able to be a formal member of the U.S. delegation. So she speaks as U.S. I speak as if, and she has been so supportive that it's hard for me to even really describe that. She doesn't always get her way either. She's really with the Copyright Office, the tra Patent and Trademark Office, the White House, and so on. But having someone who represents the interests of library in her official government role be part of our delegation makes a very big difference. And people said, how did you make that happen? Well, it's just something that I didn't do. It was 20 years ago when that agency was founded. But again, an example of how the US has always treated the libraries well from the legislative and governance point of view. So with the seat of um, government, so uh, in Slot, how many full-time staff, uh, engineering uh -huh. ministry with staff? Because I, when you oh. become a director, you will be one of the, <coughs> uh, the staff, right, during yes. that period. But then... Well, the IFLA staff, well, the IFLA headquarters is in The Hague. It actually is physically in the Royal Library of the Netherlands. Okay. That's where it physically sits along with a lot of other library organizations which have all on the same floor there. Okay. Uh, the IFLA or, uh, staff is really quite small. There's no more than a dozen or so people. Okay. It's, it's really very, very small. Mm -hmm. It depends a lot on the volunteers, so it's kind of organizing mm -hmm. everyone else. But IFLA is really run by the people who do the very exceptional. So mm -hmm. their books is run by their book librarian from Mogadetti right now. And every one of the 20 or so individual units is really run by the librarian who's elected every other year to be in charge of that. So if we're really is more a facilitator. Mm -hmm. They maintain the website and then a lot of the kind of documentation and uh, listservs and things like that that they keep going with more of this as moderators. The, but the conference, the, 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 you know, the money you receive from conference, who's, who's taking care of that? The IFLA headquarters receives, okay. receives the funding, but a lot of it goes to support uh, sending people to places like, say, Geneva or the developing countries. Okay. Yes? Uh, can you elaborate more on the efforts of, like, Blue Shield? Do you work with more developing countries? Uh, Blue Shield. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you work with more developing countries, or do you work for, like, combat issues, like, in war zones with how, like, libraries and infrastructure, such as, like, during an Iraqi project for you, and how you're going to pretty much destroy, like, the okay. national library? Well, we actually sent some people from IFLA to, to Iraq uh, uh, so seven, six or seven years ago as part of Blue Shield. 
Blue Shield works really as this kind of aggregation of the various organizations. So it may not always be someone from IFLA who will know Erlang Grain, depending on what's happening. If, if the major problem is occurring around the museum, it might be someone from the Council or on museums, or it could be someone from the International Council of Archives. But the wonderful part about Blue Shield really is that it does bring those different cultural organizations together. And sometimes all three may send representatives, sometimes only one will do that, depending on the circumstance. But it's also not just sending people to deal with immediate problems, it's also trying to establish some standards as well, and best practices. So sometimes uh, we're sending people to talk about how do you actually organize a national archive for countries that may not really have done that before, or not done it well, or it's a new country that's been created. So it's really not just only about preservation and disaster recovery, but really about how better to organize collections. UNESCO is very difficult to deal with, though it's extremely bureaucratic, and so you can, um, unlike the intellectual property organization, that's much more business-like and much more transparent, so I'm happy to actually just spend more time on the Wi-Fi side. And of course, UNESCO is a problem for us because the U.S. comes in and out and in and out. Mm -hmm. We're out again. So <laughs> it was a while we were there and welcome, and now they really don't want to see any Americans until we pay, which mm -hmm. I don't think is going to happen anytime soon. Um, yes, sir. Thank you so much uh, for coming. I um, I received a scholarship last year to attend IFLA in Lyon, which was, oh, an, it was an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you could talk about, uh, both in your experience um, attending IFLA's and uh, in the governance, like how you would recommend someone, a student or someone else who isn't associated with a, a large library institution who will fund a trip, like how you would suggest going about obtaining funding so we could participate in IFLA. Well, it's a good question, and I think, again, coming back to what's going to happen in 2016, I know that there will be special efforts that are made on part of the American Library Associations, I'm putting that in the mm -hmm. plural, to enable more first-time American librarians to come to Columbus. I mean, that's part of our sponsor meeting, but also wanting it to be a big success. So I haven't seen what those plans are yet, because it's still quite a hundred ways away, but I know based on what happened when it was in the U.S. the last time, which was 2001 in Boston, that all of us together, really all the ALA, Association of Research Library, the Law Librarians, Special Libraries, and uh, Elise, I think, mm -hmm. uh, will be now, and Kala, very, very active, the Chinese American yeah. Library Association yeah. now, will band together and figure out some way of doing, I, I think there will be two different kinds of things. There will be some scholarships, and I'm expecting OCLC to step up and do a lot of <laughs> <laughs> Columbus, right. the right. Right. But I think there also will be a lot of opportunities for volunteers to come where you may not be able to get your full expenses, but would not have to pay the registration fee, which I will, is not trivial. It's like mm -hmm. five or six hundred dollars. It's really like it's unfortunate, I think, that it's mm -hmm. gotten to be so expensive. So I really think for that year, uh, we should be looking at to see what the likely of two sorts, free, and then just kind of sent to come and work. That's a lot of fun. I mean, did you see that in the Lyon? I, I mean, that was probably one of the best experiences <laughs> of my life. It was amazing. And so you've had the experience. You know that even though you may not have been a member or there before, you can go and start talking at any one of these meetings. They're very open. Yeah, it's extremely, and I even sat on um, a business meeting for the Linked Data Interest Group. Yeah, right. Oh. Which is there amazing. Really, there are no closed meetings at all. Everybody can go and sit on anything that they wish to have. So it's really kind of it's, it's unusual. <laughs> and I'm expecting we'll have probably six or seven thousand people coming to a class. But when people figure out they can actually get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had about 55,000 people when um, IFLA came to Boston. Uh, yeah. And um, a lot of our students, as well, since I co chaired yeah. the volunteers, of which we had 300. Yeah. Registration was free, and everybody had everybody had who worked. They got a little souvenir, a <coughs> shirt, and um, they were able to go. It's fun. The, the the opening session is beautiful, every place, as and the closing ceremonies yes, too. And um, I know that when I went in two thousand to Korea, um, that was in terms of being involved. Um, Barbara Ford, past mm -hmm. president of the American Library Association, uh, and 
as several other people said, we want to get a women information um, and libraries. And you can, and they say, and you do it, Kim and Claire, yep, along yep, with right. several other yep. people out of, from different parts of the United, of the world. Right. And it's just, it's still going. Yep. It's called Will. And we thought it was, and, and it probably will continue to go because the importance of librarians are usually women. Yeah. And but providing information. So there's so many opportunities. And every student is here. You know you have access to 200 professional de development funds <laughs> up to $250. So there is money in the pot for you uh, if you're here then. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask you, I, I forgot to check to see whether is Simmons itself a member of yes. the club? Okay. Yes. And do you know which sections you're a member of? Specifically so. We used to, uh, it was continuing education, mm -hmm. yeah. um, was, an, act, was uh, some, an active area, um, and preservation, because of Michelle's area. Right, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. 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 That I can think off the top of my head. The reason I'm mentioning that is IFWA has elections every end of the year, and so uh, any member like Simmons would be able to nominate and vote for the president and the members of the governing board. But for nominating people to be on these groups like interlinear or preservation or cataloging and so on, you have to be a member of that particular section. Right. Uh, I'm right now uh, getting ready to nominate people for the six sections that Hopkins is a member of, for example. And I would just ask if I would nominate someone from um, from Wales, for example, to be a member of it, which I'm happy to do for terms of money and anything else. So that might be something else if anyone is really interested in getting more engaged in it by the standing committee. I didn't know if it was going to be in Columbus. I'm going to be a national delegate to another national international conference in Columbus in 2017, and we've started to look into um, with housing and compared to many other conferences. It's and, 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 expensive. Yeah. Yeah. and also from Boston, it is drivable. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping I don't have to drive, but um, it is drivable. <laughs> so um, yeah. it is, you know, one of the more reasonable cities than you know to have to go to Chicago or places like that, which can be pretty expensive. So. Okay, I went to but you know, my question is: I'm, I'm uh, one of the co-advisors for funding advisor for the for the group, um, along with Michelle Clooney. Yeah. Right, right. So um, we actually talked about um, as one of our activities, maybe sort of fundraising, but to support one of the students okay. <laughs> to go to IFLA. But uh, we we couldn't do it because of the South Africa is just too too. You know, too expensive, expensive for us to mm -hmm. uh, to fundraising, but you know, Columbus, Ohio is a uh, is a possibility. Yeah. Um, my question is actually going beyond IFLA. I have a lot of students actually um, advise a lot of international students, mm -hmm. and I also have a lot of American students who are interested in actually pursuing a career as an international librarian, which is basically going to a, a different country and then work over there. Do you have any um, experience, knowledge, or advice of uh, well, I do, pursuing and such a It's career? really troubling to me how difficult it is, and we're as bad as the United States, so it's mm -hmm. very difficult. We tried several times at IFLA headquarters, for example, to hire an American librarian, mm -hmm. and the laws of the EU are such that it's essentially impossible to do, because you have to assert that you could not find anyone in all of the EU mm -hmm. or the Commonwealth countries. Oh. Who could do a better job? So, like now, our Secretary General is from Australia. She is able to be appointed by her because uh, Australia is part of the Commonwealth. Okay. Her predecessor uh, was from South Africa, but he had been born in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So, so that's really a huge impediment. We can't complain about it because we're not much better. Than the people. <laughs> <laughs> so there are sometimes opportunities for fellowships, like Fulbright grants, right, or things right. like that, are short term like internships. Mm -hmm for actually taking jobs in other countries. The best way to do it, and I've had quite a number of friends who've done this, is to try to become part of the U.S. State Department network of librarians. It's a wonderful oh, okay. job. And I have, at one point, five or six different former colleagues from the Library of Congress have so gone into that. So moving around every two or three years, so you don't have to be peripatetic and get experience. It's just like being part of the Foreign Service. Mm -hmm. okay. So that is one great opportunity for people like that experience of being a librarian but in a different country. Right. We don't, of course, there's heavy immigration type right. issues. Right. Right. What if we do 
dual nationality um, with a, a either an EU country or another country in Western Europe. Bless you. <laughs> Congratulations. Switzerland's not part of the EU, but I do have dual yeah. nationality. So I, you really irritated me a lot because yeah. we, at one point you were trying to hire a copyright specialist. Yeah. At the Ifla headquarters, and there were two really just extraordinary people from the U.S. who applied, uh, and who would have been so much better with the person we hired and then fired. It was just it was truly <laughs> because of the Netherlands, particularly the Netherlands, is, is even worse as part of the EU with the kind of certifications you have to go through. That's just almost impossible. So, did you have a question? Yeah, I've got a question. I'm I'm from Saudi. I came from Kuwait, and I just wonder. How can you evaluate the participation of the Middle East countries and institutions within IFLA? Do you think there is any involvement? Um? Yes, they're very, very active. So I mentioned earlier, I, I know because I've been asked to uh, second the nomination of the director of the, National, of the Library of Alexandria to be the president of IFLA. Uh, I had the experience also last year of uh, representing the IFLA Mideast librarians at the first uh, convention that they had. Arab librarians in uh, Doha. Um, and there is, an if I, I should have glad you mentioned this, I forgot to say, there are four different regional offices of IFLA. So there is a regional office of IFLA in the Library of Alexandria that serves all the Arabic speaking countries. There's also one in Kenya, and in, um, now it's in Mexico City for, uh, for Latin America. And there's one other in, in Asia, I think, of the uh, National Diet Library in Tokyo. But, the kind of people who are on the ground, and they actually are employees, no, it's Sudan, are, are employees of IFLA, but in those four different regions. Uh, but this, this was actually very exciting to go for the first time where the Arab-speaking librarians came together under IFLA auspices for their first meetings just with librarians from that country. So it's one of the things that IFLA has talked about doing more of, but it's hard to organize both one big international annual meeting and also the regional <coughs> one unless you have, as we had in the case of the Library of Alexandria, enough money and strength there that they were able really to do a lot of the legwork themselves and organize it. That is part of the strong commitment that IFLA has. And there's a, a completely separate sections of IFLA for these different regions. So you could be like some of the member of the classification section, or you could be a member of the Asian section too, which is a different kind of way of organizing it. Some people do. Talking about ebooks and digitization and libraries, states, and things like that. What do you think when these international groups get together in 2016? What do you think the big topics or trends are going to be? Well, it's you know it's always hard to predict in our field what's going to be happening in what, even 18 months. I know, from that's now. why I asked. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Other things will still be going on. Will really be these kinds of impediments to the transport of conveyance of information, and that's why we are in mm -hmm. such all copyright laws are national, and they act as if it's, these borders really matter in a way that they used to do, and now they don't. But there are really no provisions at this point that make clear that digital information has no border. So we thought that, um, I didn't talk about this, but I worked very closely with the, with the blind community. And so we were able, two years ago, at a conference in Marrakesh, to get a treaty for the blind, which is something we were very, very supportive of uh, through, through LIFO. That took a very, very long time. Again, with the EU saying there's simply no problem. Right. There's just no problem. Even though the blind could easily document that only 5% of anything in print was accessible to people. And they right. think this is such a moral issue. It's not even, I mean, how could you argue <laughs> that there are certain people in the world who, by virtue of their disability, should not have access to 95% of what you have. It was morally reprehensible. And finally, because of that, they had to capitulate. It just got to be too embarrassing to be resisted. And part of the problem for libraries now is that I think the owners, having been embarrassed and finally having to capitulate and give in just to the blind, said, we're done with that now. There'll never be another treaty that's on the behalf of the user. So that's part of what we're fighting now. Mm -hmm. uh, so but that's really part of part of my concern, but, right. we, but at times we just have to keep at it. Mm 
And I remind everyone who gets tired of this that the blind started talking in Geneva in 1985. And it took to 2012 for them to finally get their results. We started talking there in 2003. So from one point of view, we're just beginning. And that's the way I look at it. And just this way, if you've got the right idea, you have the right on your side, you just have to keep going. And then you hope that something like the change in the EU will suddenly kind of be a breakthrough. You're ready, you've got supporters, and you can kind of build from that. But not to get discouraged, it's kind of be so you speak about um, sort of uh, try to scale up cross uh, border information transfer and things like that. Uh, would would you say that part of the bigger mission would be um, sort of resolving things like information for digital divide? Yes, yes. Are there initiatives? Um, well, there are many initiatives, but one that, that's really, I think, the most important one is exactly what we're talking about in okay. Geneva with being able to get this right to bring folks across borders, right. which we believe we have in the United States. But I will tell you that I spent about two months last year wrestling with Elsevier <laughs> to get them to agree <laughs> that in our own license that we had the right to do international lending, even though we have clear rights under our copyright law. Yeah. But people in England don't much less in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. So one of the most, I should block the, I don't know if I said this to you, but one of the most important and depressing but impressive things I ever saw was a study that was done by a man named Kenneth Cruz, who had been the copyright librarian mm -hmm. at Columbia, mm -hmm. a librarian and a copyright lawyer, and he was hired by WIPO to do the study of the copyright laws in the 186 countries that belong okay. to WIPO. And he did this first study in 2008. He's just done an update. When he came to present, he put a map of the world of, and had the, the countries colored that had provisions for libraries mm -hmm. and no color for none. Right. And all you had to do was take one look at this map of the globe and see that all the north had provisions all the South had mm -hmm. So you look at Latin America and Africa, nothing. Mm -hmm. Literally almost nothing. Whereas everybody else had something, maybe not the best thing. And you look at that, you hear people talk about the North-South divide, but you know, it didn't really ever have meaning to me <laughs> in quite the way that when I saw that so visibly displayed. And so this has enabled us to try to keep talking about this as a moral issue, which is really what access to information is. It's, yeah. it's, not, it's not a commercial thing. It's really the right to know and right. the right to communicate. And I think being able to have a detailed study like that that was done by a lawyer, it's just simply a matter of fact. It wasn't any speculation. It's why you would have a lawyer doing it. Yeah. And he's now done this update which shows almost no change at all and mm -hmm. seven years later. So this is again part of the story that we're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. What's really helping too, though, is that e the EU itself, the, well, tried to treat itself as one kind of entity that's separate, even though it has its own individual state. The librarians there are now more and more able to document and talk about their problems. They have even done the same thing from, from Sweden to Poland and from Germany to Slovenia. So even within the EU itself, there are major uh, transnational problems. So the EU is having to acknowledge, well, yes, there may be, but, but we don't need to have it now necessarily internationally, but we've got to have something better for the EU. But that raises very clearly the fact that there are cross-border issues among every single country mm -hmm. that we think can be solved by some kind of international instrument. Does the North-South divide you're talking about, does that study include Australia, or is that...? Yes, uh-huh. Okay. Australia was fine. Australia was fine. That's why I asked. Yeah, no. Australia and New Zealand. So there is, what I, I, one of the things I've tried to convey, I think, is this notion that it's, this is not just about politics or librarianship. People here are the area where we're really involved in, in the morals yeah. <laughs> of, of, of life. And that mm -hmm. what we're doing when we talk about information and librarianship is really not just a profession that has certain technical things related to it, but really about a better life for everybody. And that it's about this higher calling. It sounds so corny in a way, but it's mm -hmm. really so powerful to feel that. And I know 
working every day at a library <laughs> and you're not doing all that you don't necessarily think about it that way, but having a chance through these kind of international activities and finding that other people really don't have anything like the privilege you have and then you want to try to get that resolved to do something about it is really makes part of what being a poor librarian is worthwhile. Did <laughs> <laughs> you look at something else? Did you? Oh, oh, I oh yeah, I, I was going to ask a question. Um, is, does a like the, the Federation of Libraries, do, do they do anything with collecting information um, that is not um, like book related or resource related like that? Because um, I know some libraries around me, some research libraries around my undergraduate school did do things with aggregating their international data. Because um, I, I spent three years aggregating international education statistics related to um, trade and uh, economic policy. Um, and then large models of, I had one of 60 countries. Um, and I think a lot of limitations of what you're talking about have to do with like the Millennium Development Goals starting yes. in 2000, ending in 2015, and we're kind of here waiting to see what happens. Well, well I'm, so I'm glad you mentioned yeah. that also, because mm -hmm. IFLA has also been very much involved in setting the Millennium Goals. So mm -hmm. Stuart Hamilton, who is the number two person at IFLA headquarters, has been very actively involved in discussions going on at the United Nations. And I think they just published the first version of the revised goals. I'll, I, I could send it to, the, to you and the, the link to it. I got it actually while I've been away on this trip, so I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. So that's an area where we've been active. I hope it will be useful. I myself am somewhat skeptical about these talkathons that is what a lot of the UN does. But I also know that from the work that I've done just within the World Intellectual Property Organization, sometimes be able to cite that there is a, US, a UN mandate or a UN statement about something can be very helpful. So we've really spent a lot of time, Stuart has uh, been very much engaged in those discussions. Yeah, and, and I was kind of interested in um, if, if uh, it does have, commit any resources to aggregating data like that um, outside of like the more privatized realm of the UN and it, it is not yet. Okay. But one thing that we have done, and I would, uh, would refer you to one of the websites, is the IFLA Trend Report, which is a very, very helpful document, I think, that was created about um, two years ago, which was talking not about so much about data themselves, but drawing people together. Only a few, actually, were from the library community, but people who were in communications and publishing and so on, really trying to think about what are the trends that are most likely to affect libraries over the next 10 years. That's a very useful and very interesting document, too, that you might uh, like to take an interest in. So what they were trying to do is, at a kind of international level, at a fairly high level, think about the ways in which changes in information creation and transfer may affect libraries, but then leave it to each country to be able to house that is that going to be transferred. And that, will, that report will be updated in two, in two years from now. It's part of the interest to see well, how right were they and how quickly did the trend take hold or was that just kind of a flash in the pan and that turned out to be nothing, but something else has really emerged. We usually have the latest copy in the library. Yeah. 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 We should just about be wrapping up this event. Um, so if, if anyone has one final quick question or anything like that, or whether you're just gonna come to a close. So what do you think of the, the release of the, you know, the combination between the British Library and the Doha, I think, library, they released uh, the manuscripts about uh, Middle East history. That kind of... Uh, oh, I love it. Yeah. Mainly it was a huge project. I but it's another example that we've been using about the need for these laws that would be international in nature. And so everyone, the publishers, thought they were so smart, they'd say, oh, well, we don't think we have a problem about preservation. But they had a real problem when they understood that a lot of the preservation problems are really, or programs that we're doing now are cross-border like this. Mm -hmm. And you cannot unite things electronically like that if you've got a law in Britain that lets you do it and a law in Kuwait that doesn't. Or in the case of the um, St. Catherine's Monastery and trying to do something bringing together the documents of the British Library in England and in the USSR. Technically, a lot of what's been done is illegal. Mm -hmm. And we just are imagining, well, no one is going to come and really threatened to sue because there's not necessarily a loss of, of economics about this, but this inability to think about now preservation, bringing things together uh, in ways that we weren't able to do before is a cross-border issue also.
So I would love examples like this where more people are trying to do things like that, where, where uh, Sega just may be decided it's so important that no one is really going to complain about this, but technically they may be doing something which is a violation of copyright. For example, if there's no provision in Kuwait to preserve, period, which is true in many of in many countries, that even if you have a book that's falling apart, like you don't need to think twice about this. You either need to buy a copy, or you can just make another copy, or whatever. Uh, in co some countries, that would be truly a, a, legal, a legal step. Mm -hmm. I hope this doesn't sound too gloomy, <laughs> but it's why I'm so happy to have um, young librarians who are interested in these kind of international activities because. You could go work in one library, maybe, but you really can, I think, be a true librarian now without thinking about the way in which we interact with colleagues all around the world. So. I think we're all inspired on our own yeah. country. Yeah. We're ready to get out there and do what we can. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah.